Right, so, MP7 rebuild, where did we get to? It's been that long since I got a video out and I apologise for that, I know there's been a couple of people waiting for this one, where I'm going to be rebuilding the gearbox. Uh, part 1, we stripped the gun down, identified a couple of problems, looked at the build quality and such. Part 2, we stripped the gearbox, again, found another couple of issues just to do with it being a cheaper gun. And part 3, we painted it and got the, the tiger stripe finish on it which I'm quite happy with and that's got a good bit of attention on Instagram and stuff so that's been good people seem to quite like it although a couple of folk don't like it it was always going to be a polarising finish so that's just the way it goes but I like it so part 4 well I've kept you waiting long enough so let's just get into it gearbox rebuild with some modified parts hopefully get that power figure up to 250 plus feet per second so the first thing I done after getting all the parts cleaned up was to take the gearbox shells and give them a bit of a, a sort of grit blast in the media blast cabinet. Now that wasn't just for appearances sake, it was to clean out the inside of them, get off some of the flashing, the casting lines in there, sort of debur the inside of it because I've done it inside and out, and to key for a bit of paint and I just painted them purple because, well I could, it was a bit of a laugh. So in this gearbox we're going to be fitting some metal bushes. That's for increased reliability because we are going to be putting a lot more stress through it. We've got a bunch of shims here to get the gears set right. We've got an upgraded spring to hopefully get that power level that I'm after. That's an Eagle 6 airsoft spring. We're going to be putting an upgraded cylinder head on it. There's actually an O-ring fitted in there to provide a better seal on it, the nozzle. And although it's a piece of rubbish, got it anyway, we're going to be fitting an uh, upgraded spring guide. And it isn't really that upgraded because although the base plate is metal, this part here is plastic and it's only held on with tiny screws. So to be honest, you're probably better with the factory item. Now the first step is to fit the metal bushes because we are going to be putting a lot more stress through this. And I'm just sitting them loosely in position here before taking them to the drill press. Now, you'll see I'm using a block of wood with clearance holes drilled there. That's because the bushes themselves stick out the side of the casing a little bit. So if i just done it on a flat surface, they wouldn't push all the way through. And we're just looking for a nice, sort of tight press fit here. If they're a little bit loose, you can use a dot of super glue to hold them in. But these ones went in just spot on. Right, so that's us got our gearbox shells with the metal bushes put in. And the next step in building it back up is to sort the shimming out for the gears. Now that is a bit of a minefield. Everybody thinks they've got the best way to shim a gearbox or you must do it this way. And to be honest, it doesn't matter how you do it. It's just as long as certain fundamentals are met. You know, the gears can't be too tight, they can't be too loose, and nothing's got to be fouling. You know, the faces of the gears can't be hitting each other, or the other parts of the gearbox can't be fouling on the gears. See, as long as you achieve that, do it whatever way you like. So, what are these fundamentals that we need to get right with the gearbox when we're shimming? Well, with this one, we need to make sure that the individual gears are the correct height off the deck of the box when we're building it. Now, there's a couple of important sort of vital points. If we take the bevel gear, which is the first gear that gets the movement from the motor, and we put the motor in, the way this gear interacts with this gear, if this one is too low, if the bevel gear is too low, then the pinion gear on the motor is not going to contact it or contact it too lightly and strip the teeth. Same if it's too high, it's going to put stress on the motor shaft. So you do have adjustment because you can drive the motor in and out of the gearbox and being on an angle, that will bring the teeth closer or further apart from each other. So you just need to get it into the right ballpark. And this one, the bevel gear is sitting too low, so I'll need to bring that up. The next part that's quite important to pay attention to is the sector gear for running the piston. Now, it sits in there, and you've got the lever here that controls the fire selection. Now, because the tip of that lever works in a channel under here, this gear is actually sitting too low and the lever can't function, it jams on. So we need to make sure that this gear is lifted enough and it's not going to be much so that that lever can work freely. So 
like I said before, the bevel gear needs lifted off the deck because when the motor's in, no matter how far we adjust that motor into the gearbox, I don't know if you can see that there, it's going to, I mean, look how much play we've got there. So it's just a matter of selecting some shims and popping them on the underside. Now these are all mixed thickness, but it's not really gonna matter because I'm just bunching them together by eye. It's not looking too bad. Motor back in. And now, a lot less play. It could probably still come up a little bit more. I'll try another one. And I'm not trying to shim it perfectly to the motor because as I said before, it does have adjustment. So I just want to get it in the ballpark that that adjustment can reach because as you've seen with the play before, it was far too low. Now, if anything, that's a little bit tight. Yeah, that's a little bit tight. And that's how you do it. You just go around in circles, getting closer every time, you know, putting a shim in, taking one out, until you've got it about right. It's a bit of trial and error. There's no real quick way to do it. That's actually not too bad. By the time the gear's squared off in its casing, and we run that motor into the box a little bit, I can actually feel that that's going to be perfect. So we've got that bevel gear shimmed at the bottom into the perfect position where the adjustment in the motor will now take up the slack. So the next step, and you just repeat this for every gear, it's just that the, this gear is particularly critical. Um, the next step is to put the casing on. And see if the gear turns properly. I can see there's a little play in it still there. So it's going to be fine, it's going to turn. Let's try a thin shim. It's looking pretty good. So we'll just grab a screwdriver or anything that can get into the casing and you just want to try down in here to see if the gear's going to turn. And that does, that turns really free. If you press here on one side and on the other side, see if the gear moves. It's actually maybe a little bit loose. A little bit loose still. That actually feels maybe it's went a little bit tight. Yeah, that's actually went a little bit tight. And sometimes that's all it takes is one tiny shim and the whole thing becomes too tight. Now, in my opinion, everybody's got their own opinion, but in mine, I would rather have the gears a shade too loose than too tight because too tight stresses the whole thing, the motor, everything and it just ruins efficiency whereas too loose, if it's only a little bit, you can get away with. Right, I'm going to leave that little bit of upward play in there. We know it's shimmed right in the bottom. It's not a lot of play and the pinion from the motor is going to press down on the gear anyway so that's going to give it just a little bit of flex and play where it needs it. The next gear that I mentioned before that I feel is critical is the sector gear. For the same reason, and he's lifted up off the deck like I said, so it's just a matter of putting a shim on the bottom of that until it turns freely without fouling the selector. And then putting in the other gears. Now I'm not going to do all that in film because it's boring, um, but you just go around every gear, shimming them in nice until they almost lock up and then back off. Right, so that's me got it shimmed pretty well. I've tested all the gears individually and they're all turning in the casing, no problem. There's clearance between this gear's face and this gear. There's clearance between those two gears. Those two are meshing good. Yep, it's all looking pretty good. 
Right, so I'm not going to do the full rebuild in detail of the gearbox because once it's shimmed, it's just the reverse of what I've done in part two of this series when I stripped it down. So all that remains is to do a bench test of this because I don't like to put it straight into the gun because if there's something wrong or a snag, then you've got to strip it all back down. So I've got this test rig here that I've, I use for things like this and we'll pop a battery in. It's the same battery we'll be using in the gun, at least initially and check for voltage yep that's good back off connect the motor up and here goes yep that's looking good So, that's just got our gearbox back together, and now all that remains is to get it fitted back into the gun, do a chrono test, and a shooting test. But I'm going to leave that to the next video, because this one's already got quite long, and I do understand there's a lot of detail in it, probably quite boring for a lot of you. However, it was more for reference than entertainment, so hopefully it'll be useful. But I'll get the next video up in the next two-ish weeks, hopefully. Um, no promising. But until then, I hope it's been useful. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.